Our series today is Bring It Back. Um, and I actually got it wrong. I was laughing last night and I was like, I thought it was back to the basics. And so I had this whole thing about looking up what, base, what the word basic looks like in the dictionary. And so I was like, oh, yeah, basic. And I was like, basic sounds so basic, like just plain, you know. And then so I had this whole thing and I was like, oh, my gosh, it's actually not even basic. It's bring it back. <laughs> and I was thinking, I was like, I'm not even that old. Like, there's nothing really much for me to bring back. Like, I was born in the 80s. Any 80s? Any 80s? Yes. And I was actually raised in the 90s. So 90s, 90 kids, any 90 kids? Look at that. So 90s is actually really what I remembered. I only just came back in the 80s because, um, what's it called? Yeah, like, yeah, in the 80s, I was born in 88, so... I had one year of the 80s, but I like to claim that I'm an 80s kid. But 90s, oh man, the world looked so different back then for me. Okay, we had computers, all these sort of different things. They do not look the same today. And what about the 50s? Anyone born in the 50s? Let's go. Nice. The world looked so different, right, to what it even looks like now. And actually, I want to take it back. So, um. I wanted to talk about perspectives as well. So we've all got these different perspectives, but we all know that the world is going to continue to go, right? We all know that (laughs) things are going to be changing. And so in the world, you're going to face joy, but you're also going to face heartache. There's a few things that I wrote. There's love in the world, but then there's also so much hate in the world. There's hunger, but there's fullness. There's warmth, but there's cold. There's luxury, there's poverty. There's new relationships, and there's relationships ending. There's life, and there's death. And I want to turn to Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 8. There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Man, the world just keeps going. (laughs) The world is messed up. It's messed up. There's just so much things that I don't understand. So much heartache. So much things. I'm, I'm actually constantly on my phone crying, and I'm like, you know what, I think I need to stop, I need to stop and just pause and just breathe and come back to Christ, because there's times where I don't understand things, and it hurts me, it hurts what's going on, and I'm like, man, how can we fix it, how how can I be a part of changing something, but sometimes I need to take a pause and just be still with my God, because I don't understand everything. Psalms 4, 8, on it. John 16, 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Take heart, I have overcome the world. Take heart, God, you are so good. In a time where I feel I just, I'm confused and I don't understand, Take heart, for I have overcome the world. You know, often when we fight battles, we often want to win the battle. We want to overcome the battle. But we need to come from a place of victory because we already do. Because victory is found in Jesus. And he has already fought the the battle. He's won the battle. He's fought it. He's won it. And he was perfect. The Father, like the Father sent His one and only Son. 
And you know what? He faced some pretty horrific things. He faced a cha- some, some challenges that just, <laughs> I don't know if I could have done what he'd done. You know, the selfish and the humanness in me would be like, oh, you know what? They can save themselves. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they go, uh, they want to toss them over the board, overboard. They can say, that's honestly my flesh <laughs> speaking. But I know that, man, Jesus, he is just wonderful. But like I said earlier, I was born in the 80s, raised in the 90s, and I kind of wanted to go back there. I wanted to have a little food. I've got some pictures of the 90s. Eh? Does anyone look like, look at that. Chocolate fish are still around, eh? Are they? Yes. They are Georgie Pie up there. Do you guys remember that? Bring it back. Georgie Pie. (laughs) And another photo here. I think we missed Susie Cato. Hey! Anyone? It's our time. Kia ora, talofa. It's our time. Oh, nostalgic. But Susie, you know what? I was actually thinking about it. When, she, when a picture of her came up, because I was looking at some pictures, I was like, 90s. And then she came up, and I just went back into my childlike self. And I honestly almost wanted to cry. I'm like, I'm crying at Susie Cato. But I'm like, actually, she brings back these memories of being a child and the innocence of being a child. And I just loved, I just love it. But we're going to go look at the... Um, at the next, we're going to carry on this way. I'm not sure if it's going to come up, but oh, the fr- the computer. Anyone remember that? <laughs> Those are like the first computers, eh? But we're going to go to the 50s. Are the 50s on there somewhere? Oh, look, guys, Waddies. They had Waddies. Oh my, that's a classic. <laughs> next one. That, that just screams bougie, man. Who was dressing like that in the 50s? You guys are queens. All right, <laughs> next one. That is the computer, first ever computer built in the 50s, I think. Yeah, that's the, what the computers look like in the 50s. Who's um, born in the 2000s plus? Hands up, who's been born in 2000 onwards? Oh, yeah, there's a few of you. Okay, so we're going to go to the next picture. I just want to show you something. In 1886, (laughs) this was the first car. Did you guys know that? (laughs) I didn't know that. I had to have a look. The next one shows us the first plane, 1903. And then the next one, that's the first ever iPhone. Does anyone remember that? 2007. That was only 17 years ago. 17 years ago. And now what do they look like? pretty much flash bougie right what is going on but we can see the difference from the 50s to the 2000s right I do have a point for this trust me (laughs) I think we're going to go to the next slide he remains the same so our world is changing things look different things look really different like if I I could keep going back into the photos but um, I remember seeing this video of like a camera rolling in the streets of, I don't know, London, I think. And people were walking past and they, there was just, there was not, no electricity. It was your classic, like a first video. And I'm like, man, that wasn't actually that long ago. And how much the world has just changed dramatically in that time. But he remains the same and the world keeps going, the world keeps spinning but he remains the same. And I just want to say, Christian values. You know, as believers, we have values. Jesus still remains the same. Just because the world keeps changing doesn't make anything of the Word of God anything old school. It's not old school. So I've heard it a lot, to be honest, especially with, you know, us young ones. (laughs) It's, oh, but that's like old school. I'm like, no, that is biblical. (laughs) That is biblical truths. And actually, he still remains the same. And so in Hebrews 13, 8, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So his values the biblical biblical, <laughs> biblical principles remain the same. 
Our world's going to keep spinning. Our world's going to keep changing. Who knows, in a hundred years' time, we don't know what it's going to look like. It's still going to carry on with or without us. But he remains the same. We are to be set apart. Knowing and living out the truth isn't going to be comfortable. We know the truth, but living it out is actually quite difficult. <laughs> we read things like love is kind, love is patient, you know, all that. But actually, it's quite hard to live that out because there's a few of us that would be very, very impatient. <laughs> I'm talking to myself. I, I find myself getting a little bit more impatient when I ask my kids to do something once and then twice and then three times and then I've lost patience and then it begins and then my volume goes a lot higher. It doesn't go from, hey guys, can you do this? Hey, it just says, hey guys, can you do this? Hey guys, can you do this? I <laughs> listen. <laughs> That's a very loud voice. Oh, Matt and Crystal, oh my gosh, they are our neighbors. I'm like, every time I do it, I'm like, I should actually just have the windows wide open because it might make me go, Matt and Crystal are listening. <laughs> they can hear me. No, but we are to be set apart from the world especially. So John 15, verse 18 to 19, it says, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Welcome to Christianity. <laughs> hey, just a reminder, the world's going to hate you when you declare the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. But man, I don't know. I just, I do see things and I look around and I see what's going on in the world and Oh my gosh, my heart honestly aches. And so I'm like, Jesus. I, I sometimes do make a little joke. And I'm like, hey, everyone, look outside. And they're like, well, and I'm like, is that Jesus? <laughs> Let it be Jesus. Because sometimes I just, you know, it's just so overwhelming. And it's always been overwhelming. This is the, the crazy thing, you know. It's always coming. Things are always going to be coming against his people. But we are to be set apart from the world. You know, things will be changing, but we are to be set apart from the world. Jesus is the Son of God. He was obedient to his Father and blameless, yet he still faced some crazy opposition, some pain, and he still went to the cross for us. Number three is community. In Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven to 39 it says love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and the second is like it love your neighbor as yourself bring back community you know I think a lot of us you know we're comfortable we're comfortable with our friends we're comfortable with who we have around us we're comfortable with only sticking to our people it's just comfortable but sometimes bringing back community means looking to our neighbours that we haven't said hello to yet. Sometimes, I, I, I'm speaking to myself, guys, so I'm not thinking of anyone else but myself. Sometimes we think bring back community can mean actually knowing what's going on in our community that we have now. Knowing who's sick and who needs support. Knowing who's moving and who needs help. Knowing who needs firewood, knowing all those things, you know, but we don't come to commu community to receive those things, but we come to think about others because that's exactly what Jesus would do. He's not going, he's not coming to people and being like, this is what I want you to do. You know, we come and go, God, what can we do for you? Bring back community. A good question to ponder is, what are on the hearts of those around you when they think of you? And so um, I sh Carl sort of shared, and I might have shared before, but I did go to a funeral at Hangi, and the one thing that, that really stood out was that she engraved on the hearts of those around her, and they had memories of her generosity, but they also had memories of her challenging people. They had memories of just 
just who she was as a person, not what she had, not what she came from, not even like her background. It was all about who she was and what she engraved on the hearts of those around her. And I think, man, what do I want engraved on the hearts around others? You know, not to be like glorified, but actually that is what makes us human, right? That is what makes community. Community is what's on the hearts. It's not what you can get out of people. It's not what we, we don't want to come to a community, just be like, oh yeah, I can get this from this community. I'm going, to come to, I'm going to come to church because I need support, which, yes, great. But I'm going to come to church because I want to know, I want to be able to bless others too. I want to be able to be a part of the community of God that comes and just serves His purposes. There's nothing special, more special when we have that mindset. You know, often when I think a bit more selfishly, um, which I do quite a lot, I'm always, oh, this is, yeah, I laugh at myself only because it's just my humanness trying to come and kind of distract me from the walk with, with God. And I think about the, the selfishness that I think, and I think, man, it would be so much easier if we just had normal jobs and cared about no one but our own family. I, I do have those thoughts, and I, I actually, no, you know what? They're not my thoughts, say. Eh? <laughs> They're the enemy's thoughts. I'm going to hand it back. Those are the enemy's thoughts because... That's what separates us, that's what isolates us, and that's what then starts feeding my mind with things that are not of God. So if love, like he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and the second is like it, love thy neighbor. Turn to your neighbor and say, love thy neighbor. (coughs) What does loving your neighbor look like? Sorry, I'm going to have a drink. What does loving your neighbor look like? Have a think about that one. <laughs> hmm, <laughs> challenging. I actually, I had to ponder that one quite a lot because thy neighbor doesn't mean your best friend. Doesn't mean the, the, nice, the ones that are nice to you. <laughs> doesn't love thy, na- thy neighbor is the ones who snap at you, who uh, accuse you, who uh, have hurt you. Love thy neighbor. What does that look like? Because, man, I, I almost wanted to skip over that part because I felt so challenged. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, oh, no, I don't really want to share that part. But I feel like I have to because, actually, this is, is important. Like, the, when you open the Word of God, it's like, woo, that's so beautiful and wonderful. And then I skip the next page and I'm like, oh, that one, that one hurts a little bit. I feel convicted. I don't know about that one. Oh, what, what? You know, there's just so many emotions that I go through when reading the Word of God. But the real Word of God remains the same. Love, if love is the fulfillment of the law, what does love thy neighbor as yourself look like? And you know what? It's a good example because when, say, we attack back, you know, do we love ourselves enough that we could treat somebody else like that? And so sometimes love thy neighbor could mean silence. Sometimes love thy neighbor is turning the other cheeks. The other cheeks. There's other cheeks that you can turn as well and just keep walking away. <laughs> Sorry, inappropriate. <laughs> But it's such a good example for myself just to be still, to be still and just love by not attacking back, (laughs) love by showing patience, love by showing kindness. And so we're going to turn to Exodus 14, 14, and it says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. That in itself is very powerful because there's things that you want to fight. There's things that you want to defend, but the Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. But that doesn't mean to just, you know, whimper away and then forgive and then whimper away and then forgive. Yeah, forgive. But (laughs) there's now got to be a time where, okay, where do I need to now rebuke? Where do I need now to stand firm in my faith? 
and know when the enemy is attacking because he is going to continue to attack us. In 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 8, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Amen. Love never fails. Love is kind. Love is patient. It's it's interesting that it says love is patient first, right? Because I'm always like, okay, so love is so many things, but love is patient. It does take time. It takes time, and so our time might be very different to God's timing. And so I just want to encourage everyone today that we got to be patient with each other. (laughs) I reckon there'll be so many different opinions in this room about many matters of the world, but love is patient and love is kind. You know, we don't come on top of people with our opinions. You know, isn't it funny when people are like, how are you? Oh, I'm tired. Oh, yeah, you look tired. I was like, oh. <laughs> I don't ask for your opinion. <laughs> no. But it's true, though. Sometimes I'm all, that is the name. I, I try and be a little bit more honest instead of saying good, because sometimes I'm actually not good. Sometimes I can feel that I'm tired. Sometimes that I, f- I feel sad, upset, angry. But then, you know, you don't want to like someone just walks past say, how are you at the supermarket? Oh, I'm angry. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do with that? I don't know. But you know what? If someone said it to me, I would be like, okay, why are you angry? <laughs> you know, there's going to be things that we're going to face, but love is patient and love is kind. Another point I wanted to share this morning is seek kingdom. Seek the kingdom. Matthew six thirty three says, but seek First, his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You know, in a world that we live in today, it's quite easy to not do that. (laughs) It's quite easy to wake up and think, oh, yeah, I need to get this, 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 this done. Oh, I need to go buy this. Oh, I need to go do this. Busy, busy, busy. We're just so busy. Um, I was watching this... um, Documentary. I don't know if it's a documentary. I don't know. But it's about um, people who live in the coldest, coldest part of the world that you can actually dwell in. Um, and it reaches negative 71 degrees. That's our temperature, 71. Not Fahrenheit, but Celsius. 70, negative 71. And kids still go to school in that weather. And they showed these kids, you know, rugging up putting everything on. And as they were walking, some, some of their eyelashes were going, had little snow, little cold snowflakes on them. <laughs> that, it's wild, right? But I, there was this one family that I just, I admired and I was like, boys, get in here. We're watching this documentary <laughs> because this kid that was a part of that family, he would, his, 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 he would wake up, he'd have breakfast, his mum would cook, all those sort of things. But then then he would go out. He was only nine years old. He would go out and then he was chopping firewood. He was he literally went in um in the ice and they like had to do this whole thing to get fish because they have to fish for their food. And I'm like, oh my gosh, my kids are so privileged. They need to know what real work looks like. I'm like, this is survival. This is survival. And these kids are just out here living a simple life. And I'm like, I actually, there was this weird desire in me that was like, man, we get so caught up in the world that we forget just to be simple. Just to wake up. Making the bed is a privilege. We can get up. We can make our bed. I have a bed. I have a home. You know, the world often tells you to live the dream life. And actually, yeah, I I was that person. I'm like, we need to live the dream. (laughs) If we were doing that, we'd be living the dream because that's what the world wants to sell us. And I'm not saying don't live like that. (laughs) Do you? But I'm saying like we look at God and we go, okay, God, what's important to us? And I'm not saying go and drop everything and quit your job. Please don't. (laughs) Oh, Teddy said. (laughs) No. 
But how do we appreciate what we are currently doing, what we are currently blessed with? How do we appreciate that? How do we appreciate being able to go to school? How do we appreciate being able to learn? Appreciating that we have a home, that we have kids that are strong and healthy, because there are kids that are not. And so when I yell at my kids, I'm, I need to remind myself, actually, God, I've got beautiful children that are learning, <laughs> that are growing. And I have to put, you know, I, have, I need to be more patient, more kind. And every day I wake up, I think, God, like this morning, I was like, oh, I could look at what I'm doing as a task. I could look at it as being difficult and hard. I could look at it as being heavy. But actually, I, I need to look at it and go, man, God, what a privilege. God, what an honor that I can just come here before everybody and encourage everyone with the word of God. That what an honor to be able to get to church if you have a car. What, what a blessing. Everything. I'm just so appreciated and content with what God has given us. And just watching that family, I'm just like, Wow. They, they know how to just be with each other as well, be in each other's presence. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So regardless of how we are living our life, whether it is here, there, everywhere, whether we are, um, have amazing jobs, whether we don't have jobs, where we have amazing voices and don't have amazing voices, whatever we're doing, we're doing it, to, we're seeking God first in it. Man, when I woke up this morning and I was just like, oh, God, you first, you first, Lord. And it needs to not just be when I'm about to have a, you know, share a message. It needs to be on a Monday, even when I'm feeling sick. On a Tuesday, when my kids woke me up from yelling. When, on, a th- on a Wednesday, all these different things. God, you first. I seek you first. I come before you and seek your face. So what does it look like to seek first the kingdom? It's prayer. It's opening his word and actually meditating on it. There's so many times where being able to meditate on scripture, like I'm not going to always have my Bible right next in my pocket. You know, I need to memorize, bring back memorizing scriptures. Like, I think that's what Carl grew up with, memorizing scriptures, where even when I would go to youth groups, they'd give us a little scripture, and they'd make us memorize it. And I'm like, but why? But because when I'm out there getting triggered, love is patient. <laughs> love is kind, <laughs> because I've meditated on it, and it's reminding me of everything. When I'm feeling anxious and overwhelmed, peace. You know, there's, this, there's, a, there's an important part of us to bring back meditating on His Word, not just reading it once and closing it, but actually meditating on it. Bring it back. Bring back worship. And so I was thinking, I'm not bring back worship. Worship is always, it's everything. Worship isn't just the songs. I actually, when I was um, a teenager, I used to think that when someone would say worship, I just went, ah, oh, songs. That's what, my, what I thought it was. But actually, worship is way more than that. It is our everything to Him. It's our resources. <laughs> it's our time. It's our surrender. It's fasting. It's an act of worship. It's giving. It's, it's um, blessing. That is an act of worship. Why? Because you are... It like, you know, we hear of stories, we hear of things that are going on around us and people in need. And it takes a lot to really just go, hey, this person's in need. I'm going to bless them. That's an act of worship. You know, and we're not going to do it just because we feel, um, oh, I'm a good Christian, so I'm going to do that. It's not for recognition or acknowledgement. We give because we love God. We give because it's a sacrifice and it's a worship. We don't come to receive. We don't go to church just to get around people to see what we can get out of them. No, no. We come to be able to be a blessing. 
And so I want to challenge people with that because often we can look at church as a need supplier or, you know, I've actually heard the word hospital a lot, which is interesting, but yeah, I I get the, I understand what they're thinking, but I'm also like, at a hospital, we're not broken. <laughs> you know what I mean? When we come, yeah, come, let's be restored, let's be renewed. But we are not, we are not broken because we've already had the victory because of Jesus Christ, right? So we are full. We are full. Um, and you know, not not yeah, I actually probably have said it's a hospital once in my in my time as well. But this is a place where we come and we are joyful, where we, uh, we have sorrow, a time for everything. And, you know, fasting is another thing as well um, that you can, you know, we can bring back if you haven't fasted for a while. Um, I'm not saying go starve yourself, but what I'm saying is that when we come to God, what is something that we can sacrifice that draws us closer. And biblical times, actually, they um, would fast before winning a battle. And I'm like, man, that's that's powerful in itself. So when you're facing things that you don't understand, there was, you know, a time last year where I was like, I don't know what to do. The only answer I had was to fast. And so I would I would sacrifice, which is actually really hard because I love food. <laughs> love food. And I'm like, oh, this is actually, this would be the ultimate fast for me is to give up food and so I'm like okay God I'm gonna have to do that one because I know that I need to see breakthrough and you know just fasting wasn't necessarily just what to see the breakthrough happen but actually it did something in me that I would I would much prefer than seeing the breakthrough because actually in me I'm like oh, no I started to walk in victory because I had the victory I had a mindset before fasting of oh my gosh I just want this to be done I want it to be I want to be victorious I want to, you know but actually as I was fasting I was like actually no yeah I know my God I know Him and I know that I can stand here and I can actually have victory in Christ. And so when we lay things down, it shows it's a sacrifice. It's hard. Giving is hard because we're sacrificing a part of what we have earned. But man, God is just such a wonderful God that he supplies all our needs. But, you know, often we can look to the world and go, oh, you know, like Crystal said, I'd rather spend it at Kmart. (laughs) <laughs> Actually, I need those containers to sort out my organisation. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. It's it's something that we think about, but I'm like, actually, no. We need to. We, there's going to be some sacrifices that we have to make, but it's not because of what Teddy said. It's actually because what God wants to do in your world. And I know that we wouldn't be the people we are today if we didn't sacrifice a lot. And so I just praise God for that. Even when I didn't want to, when my flesh is like, nope. But I praise God because my flesh tells me this all the time. Like every every time I have, you know, I speak, there's always something why I can't speak. And Carl is the one that hears it all the time because I'm like, ah, sorry, Carl, can't preach on Sunday. And he's like, yes, you can. (laughs) Yes, you can. I'm like, no, (laughs) no, I can't. And I'm like, actually, I had to, that's when I, he sends me, basically just says no, because he knows that now I'm going to talk to God about it. And he knows that (laughs) that if he said, okay, then I wouldn't go to God and talk about it because I'm like, yes, (laughs) I'm I'm done. I've done it. I don't have to do it. I don't have to think about it. But I know when, when I get, you know, get told no, I'm like, oh my gosh, okay. I have to go talk to God about that one (laughs) because my pride's a little bit hurt. No, my, it's just this humanness in me that I have to process. We go through things. It doesn't mean that I'm um, not obedient to the call, but I had to go through these processes of thinking about not doing it because it's a fight. It's a fight between the the flesh and the spirit. We're not going to like each other all the time, guys. On the other side of the room is going to be different to this side of the room. We're all going to be different. Have a look around, guys. Have a look around. Spot a new face. Go see someone that you might not. Is this awkward? Because everyone looks a bit awkward. Spot a new face. You might not know somebody. There might be one new face that you never know where you're, your, the community would look like around you in a year's time because we actually looked around us. And I just want to leave with this encouragement of sacrifice because I loved how um, Crystal said, introverts, sorry, because <laughs> it's so true. Introverts are like, ugh, I 
skip this part. <laughs> I don't want to talk to people. I don't want to high five. Carl high five 65 people every single time. 65 Lakewood Drive. So <laughs> that's our address here at Topol. But what I'm saying is there's going to be a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice to meet new people. You know, um, <laughs> yesterday I actually saw it just in front of my eyes. We were at Micah's rugby after match game and actually their game was a little bit um I'll just say the word nasty um the the team that Micah plays with they actually all come from really good homes and they're all just very nice kids they're nice kids but the other team that they were playing were uh, yeah I had to yell out and say hey stop swearing (laughs) because it was just so ugh just, and I'm like, these are under 13s, they're young. They're just like swearing at each other, not just at the team that they're playing against, but to each other. And they're like, you're trash. And I'm like, wow, no wonder why you guys aren't winning because you guys aren't playing as a team. And anyways, afterwards, um, there were, you know, you had some, some kids in there that were just amazing at what they were doing. But um, afterwards I saw and I noticed something and I'm like, why are our kids... They, they, there was one table here and one table here. Normally, though, our kids are quite spread out amongst all the, 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 the kids that they're hosting, which was the opposition team. But they, none of them were sitting next to them. And I, I, knowing me, I walked past. I was like, oi, <laughs> I was like, go and sit with them. Why aren't you guys sitting with them? And I was like, cool, I've done my deed. They're like, now they're going to go and sit with them. Then I turned back around. They got their food and they didn't go and sit with them. And I was like... I was like, why aren't you guys sitting with him? And they're like, eh. And then I asked Micah, I was like, Micah, get over here. <laughs> I was like, Micah, why aren't you guys sitting with him? Why is everyone so... And he's like, because of, they were like swearing at us. They are calling us the K word. And I was like, what? <laughs> what is the, what's the, but anyways, they're calling out them lots of names. And I'm like, this is okay. And I'm like, man, I'm not, you know, obviously they were a bit brutal. But what I was thinking, I was like, man... Our own kids already know what it looks like to just disengage with something that they don't like. And I'm not going to tolerate abuse because, you know, abuse is abuse and that's not okay. But I thought, man, I think these kids just didn't know anything else but them, but what they were growing up in. And I, and I, in my heart, I'm just like, but you guys can be that change for them just by being in their world because. You know, we don't we don't know what we don't know until we're sort of exposed to it. I didn't know Christianity until I got invited to church. I didn't know. I heard about God. I was like, oh yeah, that. And this he's in the sky. I heard about heaven because often people, when someone would pass away, you were told they're in heaven now. You know, and so I'm like, okay, I know what God is. I know what a heaven is. But there were many different aspects and perspectives that I had. But we can be that light in somebody's world. We can be the inviter in someone's world. We can say, hey, come to church. It might not for everybody, but we can still be the church outside these walls. We are the church outside these walls. When this isn't church, it's just a building. Literally just a building. And that's when we start seeing the floors. We're like, oh man, it's leaky building. <laughs> like there's things in the walls. There's paint that is chipped. But you know, we see things when the church isn't the church, but when the church is the people. And so when we exit this place, we're not going with, hey, come back and you can come to church. But no, we're going, we're like, hey, how can I be the church today? What does my life look like when I walk out these doors? That's why we need to come every single day to meditate on His Word, day and night, day and night. And it's just so beautiful to see when our young people are coming in and they, they, they know this place. Like, I love that I've, I've given birth to three boys that now know this place where I didn't have that. And I'm like, man, what a legacy that I get to be able to have that my kids can. Although sometimes I'm like, oi, <laughs> I'm like, you guys need to be perfect pastor kids, but actually they're not. <laughs> I love it. I'm like, gosh, y'all, they're the typical PKs. 
they, that's what they call pastors' kids, apparently. They had a little bit more rebellious than the rest. And so I'm like, no, I'm not going to speak that over them. They're going to be good humans. I'm going to make them sit at the front. No, I'm not going to make them do anything. But I am a reflection, you know? And so when I, I have to challenge myself and constantly look at myself and be, okay, God, what do they see in me? As a mum, what do that? What do um, my students and the people that I work with see in me as a, as an employee? You know, and so I want to constantly challenge everyone with that. Come, go, and be the church. One, two, three, four.